under education ha has become a massive issue. Spurred on initially by the school closures during the COVID-19 pandemic, exacerbated by the economic crisis. So we see children underprepared to take on real world challenges. There has been effectively a learning deficit with children being left behind. Have there been any structured, streamlined efforts to make up for that lost time, to make up for the lost skills? Let's find out. Today's uh, topic discusses the crisis in education in Sri Lanka. We are joined by Professor Arjuna Parakrama, Emeritus Professor, University of Peradeniya. Good evening and welcome, Professor. Good evening. Uh, good to see you again on the show. Good to be here. Professor Parakrama, we see a dumbing down of kids in Sri Lanka. Children are increasingly being left behind. There are massive disparities despite us boasting of a free education system. How must this be rectified? I think uh, that's a very important question. I think let's look at first principles to begin with. Mm -hmm. You're quite right. In fact, there was a shocking um, revelation, uh, a study was done in March 2023 that looked at uh, children in, in year three in terms of their their outcomes, you know, how, how well they had fulfilled the outcomes in numeracy and literacy and they found that only 8% of the students had fulfilled that. So the 92% were in in sort of default as it were and this is not the fault of the children at all. I mean if we learn one lesson it's never never close the schools you know because the schools are places where other things happen as well as learning the children share they come to meet each other it's a it's a it's a separate space of friendship of you know of taking their time if both parents are working and particularly adversely affects the poorer children more than the, the richer ones who have other ways of managing their time so i think th that's a given that was a tragedy the fact that the schools were closed so arbitrarily and so long mm. and so unnecessarily this is a, this is also but it's symptomatic of a kind of top down decision making process which is not interested in children and not interested in the poorer children, the more disadvantaged children. That's what we're seeing. Mm. I think um, it was Naomi Klein who talked about the shock doctrine where she said that, you know, crises are used in some way for governments and regimes to, to implement policies that would not work elsewhere. Now, for example, we are having further dismantling of free education because the digital divide is a very clear thing. We know that during the COVID period, I mean, the statistics are, are quite clear that there was a very large percent, possibly 45 percent of the students who could not access any form of uh, you know, device. They didn't have a device. Now it's slightly better. So they were completely left out. Whereas if we had said free education is not there, we're going to educate only the middle class and the upper classes, there would be an uproar. But here you use the technology and the crisis in order to leave out that group of people. So it's exclusionary it's by nature. Absolutely exclusionary. But you know, it pretends not to be. You mm. know, it pretends not yeah. to be. So I think that's that's very. So if schools had not been closed, then this issue would not have come. You know, right. then the children would have learned the way they had learned. Otherwise, not only you need a, a kind of device, a smartphone, you need a laptop or some other computer. So that, that is pr particularly there. But I think what we are seeing is an unraveling of precisely the devaluing of free education, things that all of us came out of that we cherish. That is unraveled. We have, I think, education being seen as an investment. Charlie, that is not a rights-based thing. So if it's an investment, why would you invest on the poor, the disadvantaged, the street children and so on? Because that may not translate into a university degree. For example, if I had to give you a crude example, if health were an investment, you wouldn't invest in my health because I'm, I, I have many illnesses, I probably won't make it. But if health is a right, then I need to be able to get the treatment that others do. You see, investment means you need a return on it. And the whole point about free education is everybody needs to get that education. Mm -hmm. And it's only then that we and our country is proud in that it was able to, it's one of the few places in the world that you can become a doctor or an engineer or a professor or an artist or a literature person, even if your parents have never been to school. You know, it's a very rare right across the board. Mm. Maybe exceptions, but still that possibility is there. Mm. And that's being deprived of us. So what, what we have is 
you're right. There is this under education is not being addressed. They're still trying to do the exams. They want to get the timetables right. They want to put the three exam in this year. You know, we have those three major exams: the year five, the O level, and the A level. So tuitions are geared to that. Education is geared to that. There is no holistic education. There is no educational values, and the stress on the children is unbelievable. As a result, they underperform. They drop out. I mean, let me tell you the dropout figures. You'll be you'll be amazed to know that of 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 the of the children that we have, say about three hundred and this is the figures of the cohort that came in two thousand four. About three hundred and two thousand. These are official government figures. Three hundred and two thousand joined year one. Okay. Right. Of that, already forty five thousand had dropped out by the O level. No way. Yes, and then so about two hundred fifty-two, fifty-seven thousand mm -hmm. sat the O level, eighty thousand failed to qualify. That right. simple O level exam. So that's a third have not qualified. So and then at the A level, one hundred seventy-seven thousand sit, and one hundred and twenty thousand of that miss the miss high education altogether. So we have basically two hundred and forty-five thousand children who out of that three hundred and two, so a good sixty percent of them. Don't have a, don't have access. So of that, about fifty sixty thousand go into unskilled labour. The others try to get some course here or there and pay lots of money. They get into debt, you know, and all of that kind of stuff. So what are we doing? We are we are clearly taking the cream, the youth, the future leaders, and then sort of shape uh, cutting it down. Cutting Cutting it down to you have a group that's about fifty-seven, and if you look at the socio-economic status of the fifty-seven thousand that get in, you will see that they are middle class and upper class, right? Mm -hmm. And there are people who maybe have may have the opportunities to study elsewhere. So it's not even a fair system. And what we're having now is a gradual entrenchment of that. Let me give you one more frightening example. As you said, not only is is it not addressing the deficit? It's using that deficit in order to pursue that neoliberal agenda. Let me give an example. Now students are uh, applying for private universities, which is very good, and they are they are paying the fees. It's difficult for them to pay the fees. They are paying the fees. The interest is paid by the government entirely. Mm -hmm. But this same government, which is paying the interest on the fees, school fees of private students, is not paying the basic Mahapola scholarship to the students who have who have qualified much better and who entered. So where are the priorities? And that's five thousand rupees a month. This is much much more. So government is paying for those pri relatively privileged students who want to study in a private university, much greater amounts, but not paying the promised. Scholarship to these students, so naturally they are dropping out. They are doing jobs. They are jobs. Many of them do security guard work. Some of them don't come to university. They have to work in the fields and so on. So you have a huge problem in which I think the state university system, state education system, is under collapse. Professor, um, by our collective silence, what what we are doing is effectively. Ensuring that the more disadvantaged children end up as the the coconut pluckers and the three wheeler drivers and the security guards, so that it benefits the privileged. Absolutely, right? absolutely, yes, the middle class and the privileged. So that's what this shock thing has happened. That's what the the catastrophe and the crisis has done. We should have. We should look at what kind of learning loss is there, and mm. the learning loss is it is greatest with the poorest students, the students who don't have access, students who don't have even now because cost of living is so high, malnutrition is hugely high. Yeah. Let's take school feeding. Now the government is saying they don't have money to continue the school feeding process. You are familiar with Amartya Sen, no? the great mm. Nobel Prize of winning. He said, "Stop all development programs, do school feeding, and your country will develop." Because parents will send their children to school. Sure. That notion. We are going to feel this ten years from now. They say something like a third of the of the population of children under four are malnourished or stunted. And that is that puts us again the t um, among the tenth worst country in the world. 
this country which had physical quality of life indices which are very high which you know prided itself of education health and so on is going down very fast mm. so i think this this point i just want to make that in general which goes beyond the education thing the tragedy and the and the anger among the public is this there is a group of people who were responsible for this crisis these sets of crises right they go, go scot free but yeah. the burden of the crisis is placed on the poorest mm. so the poorest have to suffer for a crisis they did not create yeah. while those who created the crisis remain scot free yeah. that's uh, horrible isn't it yeah absolutely and professor when we speak of um the education paradigm comprehensive sexuality education is something that school children have been denied effective education has been denied as a result of which we see an exponential increase in the incidence of sexual abuse sexual violence rape uh, against children um and from this i'd like to draw your attention to the pivotal role that religious leaders need to play um we've seen our fair share of rebel rousing myth making religious leaders across religions um causing disunity and disharmony and division uh, and for the most part they are not held accountable and they are one sect of people who are opposed to sex education in schools um yeah. so i mean i i don't know how to to disentangle um this this thought process because it's it's quite warped yes i think the problem here is is i mean you've hit the nail on the head the problem is very complicated but nonetheless the solution is clear we have to maintain that secular distinction between religion and education that's very clear in fact I, i you can see how insidious is i might incur lots of enemies for this but i'll say that that certain religions particularly dominant religions sort of invade civil space they invade the the classroom they invade other other kinds of places invidiously and and sort of quietly and tacitly now in the bulk of government schools we have schools that are restricted to a particular religion now how would that be right it seems to be a violation of the constitution so but they are arbitrary yes some schools only take you know real students of a particular religion that's quite wrong yeah you know so if you look at at this situation yes sex and, gen- and gender education is a must it is necessary but the problem is not merely one of of uh, the of, of the overall structure the teachers themselves are squeamish about it they're not aware they have not got that kind of said they become very conservative but one thing is very clear religion has no role to play in a secular school space i think that's very important mm-hmm. and we what we don't have we don't even have religion we have religious institutions individuals so a politicking for power and and sort of superficial popu- popularity kind of thing who intervene and as you say it cuts across all of the religions but we need to stand up and say no we are not doing that academics are not doing that intellectuals are not doing that we are scared about antagonizing religious leaders so called religious leaders they are not real religious leaders if they were they wouldn't be doing this but i think so that's why i keep coming back to this is a crisis if we don't intervene and i'm really glad that you're raising these difficult questions not many other people do that if we don't intervene we become part of the problem as you say gender and and sex education inclusive education uh education that that brings communities together that talks about the difficult issues of the war reconciliation you know criminalization of muslims the whole plantation malaya tamil question that is necessary now in the 21st century they talk about about critical thinking about communication mm. about creativity now those are non those are not subjects in our curriculum those should be instead of it we are racing towards finishing a syllabus in mathematics or finishing a syllabus in chemistry or something like that can you see how what has happened so we have lost time catching up is in tuition classes 
you know so the students are under pressure i know you know that in the advanced level classes in the government school hardly any student goes to school in that last year they okay. don't go they are in tuition classes which is a travesty we need to be teaching values education where is the values education that must be inclusive that must be secular and that must involve the basic skills for them to become young adults and as you say gender and sexuation is crucial there as is inclusive education as is understanding of each other's religion and culture and all of that space respect for that you know mm. it's not happening if we connect education to the budget as we have an up upcoming budget um, in the cards as well we need to pay our teachers sufficiently how has that not happened well, i mean it's not rocket science professor to realize that our teachers are the ones who um enable our students to um understand life in the most magical way yes. and we pay them peanuts absolutely i mean to give you an anecdote my professor was is a very senior professor he worked at cambridge university and in many places in, in in the us as well his wife is a teacher and she always tells me i get paid more than my husband so as a school teacher as a senior school teacher she gets paid more i think we have to, we have to recognize that the teaching is a key avocation it's it, you know we want people who will do that not people who do then have to grab around again the tuition issue is that they are underpaid they are underpaid teachers they are under respected they are not provided proper training i'm afraid i will be failing my duty if i said the nie and there's a new director general i hope he'll do something has failed in that process of okay. making the syllabus as new teaching the teachers how to teach you know and and bring whatever we teach we always teach value as well whether we don't teach it or we do so respect for teachers is crucial i i still have teachers who i respect more you know almost as much as parents in that sense i don't sit in, when they're there you know and that's natural that's not some phony kind of thing mm. because they taught us how to how to live now that part is missing here right what is here is a very instrumental thing you have to pass an exam then you have to pass another exam then you have to pass another exam and that's all that teachers do you know so i think that that's part of the crisis so the crisis of education we have to reconceptualize education if you look at the national education policy 2020 2030 mm. it's i'm sorry to say it's 417 pages long but it's not worth the paper it is written on because it does not look critically at any of these issues if you look at the comparative national policy in done in india the 68 pages it is wonderful it actually looks at what education should do to the individual how it should transform them how it how it is participating in in the actual development thing so the individual and the society the question of values mm. so we have missed that bus you know i think we need to what we are doing is now putting little you know little sticking plasters on the wounds as it were to try to sort it out but i blame the academics and the intellectuals who are standing by we are still thinking the economic crisis is the most important the political crisis is the most important it's the education catastrophe that has led to this if we had students who are who can think critically who can communicate that stuff and who are creative then this issue won't come now education as i said is an instrumental thing education for the marketplace we worship the marketplace if the marketplace can't provide you a job that means your education is useless right so where what what does that mean you know mm. so if you look at law and i know you so that means only the lawyers who make a lot of money are the are the good citizens and those who do pro bono are not i can't understand this this is the entire mindset that we have so what we have then is a kind of model which says we are now going to do economic recovery justice humanity human rights you know decent all that must be sacrificed in the name of this so called recovery or reform i don't think that can happen with one without the other absolutely so an education is a pivot education is crucial mm. we're not doing that universities are failing do you know that universities have 35% um, vacancies in academic positions and yet they're increasing the number of students for politics right but we can't complain in the system the system has been always what it is bureaucratic politicized huh? and mediocre we need to do something about that so in terms of budget 
how must the budgetary allocation for education now be increased? I think we are again competing with Afghanistan, the lowest place in South Asia uh, in terms of, uh, of the budget for education vis-a-vis -vis the GDP. Ours is 1.9 which is Afghanistan is the same and Afghanistan is a country that believes that half its population should not be educated. So can you imagine we are in that company. So unless we spend more money we are not going to solve any of these problems. If we take a fraction of the military expenditure we can we can uh, you know do what we need to do for education very clearly. So one thing is the resources the allocation is not enough. Mm. What we have is an unequal system. I mean of the 11,000 something schools, we have slightly over 11,100 schools, 3,000 schools have less than 200 students and 200 schools have over 2,500 students and there is even about 1,500 with under 50 students. Okay. So we, we do not even change that, we let them rot and, and disintegrate and go away. Those small schools are not, not should not be abolished because some of them are caste based schools. I know schools who have 10 students because the bigger schools around will not have them because these are under caste students. Mm. So they have to be protected or they are students in remote areas and they cannot travel that far. We have to nurture education must be built on equity. So the budget needs to reflect that kind of thing. Education for all is what we want. You know, you can't say uh, it's an investment. Therefore, poor people should not be educated. Street children should not be educated. Uh, if your parent is not a doctor, you can't be a doctor kind of thing. You know, that sort of thing. So the budget needs to be increased. And if you look at last year's budget and the budget before, even though the budget is small, even then key aspects are not implemented. Right. So they are returning some money. Can you imagine from an inadequate budget you are returning money and one of the areas they are returning is this question of, of giving resources to all the schools. That is not happening. Mm -hmm. They concentrate on these 300 and something national schools. There are 373 national schools, 3.7 percent. All the resources are given there. And if you look, let me take a, a, a symptomatic case so that you understand. If you look at the national figures, 2016 is the latest I could look at, there are 3000 plus excess English teachers in the country, but there are probably about a thousand schools that do not have English teachers. Why? Because schools like Royal College and so on have 30, 40, 50 excess teachers. So it is unequally distributed. The, the more privileged schools have an excess of English teachers in the urban areas. There are so, it is not even, not even that there are not enough, it is not distributed properly. So, the education system is a microcosm of our society, the inequalities, the injustices, the discrimination and quite frankly the sort of, uh, you know, the, the sort of throwing away of people as if they are dispensable entirely takes place here. So, if we sort this out, I think we can address the others on the longer term. At a macro level, Professor, uh, do you feel like we are just stumbling along without any proper direction where we are just being reactive and responsive to crisis upon crisis and we have no clue what, uh, what is up next? I think we, yes, if we are talking about us, but I believe the regime is very clear. They want to devalue free education from kindergarten to university so that private institutions can flourish and then education can become the privilege of a few like it was a long time ago. You see because it is through education that you have people from all walks of life you know achieving what they do. So that is the thing. So we are reacting I agree we are not getting the picture right but I think if you look at the picture carefully it is too much of an accident to see f universities are being defunded, not, not only unfunded, defunded. Huh? Okay. Universities are being defunded, schools are being you know um, clamped down, they are being restricted, resources are being restricted and the function of the, of the school is now taking place in the tuition class which is for fees. So, it is no longer free education. The education department pays only certain aspects of the recurrent expenditure. Students had to bring desks and chairs, they had to bring various kinds of things, so the poorer students drop out further and further. So, you are going to see the repercussions of this in 5 to 10 years. So, I think yes, we are not doing enough because we are reacting, but it seems to me the system is 
pursuing the neoliberal agenda of making education investment and therefore centralizing its resources on a few major areas which he thinks are useful and then providing lots of options to the other to others for private institutions. Professor, thank you for putting this in perspective so clearly. Um, it sounds really scary. What do we do? I think it is again like the other issues like the political and economic it is too important an issue to leave to the authorities. They have bungled it for years and years yeah. and years and years. We have the free education thing which is gradually being dismantled. We have an education department and a system that is apathetic, that is uh, mediocre and that is politicized. Mm. I think we need to get back to that system. Let me take the school feeding issue. It is a very interesting issue. They are and very important. There is money is allocated up to about 100 rupees per student. What did they do? The government decided to subcontract it to some local person to do so naturally the students get whereas it is clearly the school development society should be the thing. So, the parents are there, the teachers are there, the principal is the head of that. That should be the place where nutritious food is prepared for the students instead of it somebody outside some Mudalali or some you know somebody who has some connection to the local politician did it. So, it flopped. The cost was much greater the government cannot sustain it. Mm. So, what I am saying is we need to bring back that and I think there we need to have a platform of people that work towards education. So, there is no long there is no short answer it has to be long, but it needs a commitment of all of us. All right. Thank you very much Professor Arjuna Parakrama Emeritus Professor University of Peradeniya. Thank you for sharing your perspectives. Thank you very much for asking. Thank you for watching us we will see you again tomorrow. Good night. <laughs>